2024, we are investing in eternity with this year's focus on the church and how we are added to it, his family. The week of devotionals in your book, Deal with a Portion, begin asking several questions about the church. Namely, does it matter? Does the church matter? And according to the entire epistle of Ephesians, I encourage you to read Ephesians this week, complemented with those devotionals. The book of Ephesians emphasizes that as a child of God, with Him on earth, in His body, it's within the church that our life's purpose is accomplished. Our life's purpose is to glorify God in Christ. And that is accomplished within His church. So I would say the church is very important. Only through His church do we see the work of salvation and the fruit of righteous living. So I would say it's very important to carry out the Father's will as He has planned in life. And no, uh, no matter how convincing we are to others of this, others when they contact us need to at least know that we are convinced of this. Christ's church is awesome. And you know I use that word meaningfully, reverently, and intentionally. God is awesome and awe-inspiring, and everything He does is, and He has established through His Son, the church. As the body of Christ, His church is His present incarnation of His mission, His word, and His life. Incredible, isn't it? And as His family, the body of redeemed saints and siblings, it represents his identity by those who wear his name mentioned by the prayer Joe earlier and the comments today for communion Steve made reference of how important it is to represent God to bring honor to his name and the world in which we live amidst all the corruption in this world the church the church represents everything that is still just and pure, and holy, and right in this life. The church. The church is awesome. But I know that when people hear the word church, they don't have that good feeling. <laughs> they don't have many good feelings, perhaps. And we've mentioned several misconceptions before. The church is not a building. Uh, it's not a building where some people think it's just a place where, frankly, strange people gather to practice religious practices. You've heard the phrase before, have church. Some people think we're having church. Okay, that's not okay. Not really, not quite right. Uh, some people see church as just an event, preferably only for one hour, unless it's entertaining, then feel free to go further. But then that becomes about us and not what we're here for. For a lot of people, they think it's just downright boring. And if I had an answer to that, I would say, for so many people who are carnally minded, any spiritual instruction would seem so foreign that they think it doesn't relate. It's irrelevant, and therefore, no matter the quality of content or passion in delivery, they just dismiss it all. This doesn't apply to my life. It's boring, not entertaining. For others, some people hear the word church, and they may actually think about people. Mentioned by a prayer earlier. They may actually think about people. That's good. But their definitions, of course, would probably be more broad to include people across all divisions and flavors of religion uh, who are what we would say a churchgoer, a Bible reader perhaps, or a strong person of faith, a benevolent person. So they might see church as a benevolent organization just in the community to do a lot of good things, but it's not worth their own time, at least in this phase of life. So while they're thinking of these people and they're hearing the word church, they may admit that some of the nicest people they know are church folk. But some people's experiences, uh, not so much. They may say some of the meanest people they know are church folk. With negative feelings, sometimes even justified from bad past experiences, some hear the word church and see it as an institution only of people who are either for those perfect or think that they are to condemn everyone else 
and that makes their faults only all the more transparent. We have all met people who think, well, who, we have all met people who just don't behave like the Christ we read about. And it doesn't seem like they want to try. If you look at people, here's the key. If you look at people, you will see a lot wrong with the church. That's true. It's a self-admission. If you look at the people, you'll find a lot wrong with the church. But here is the more important point. Here is a stronger truth. In his family, there is nothing wrong with the church so far as the divine is concerned. Only Jesus is without sin. Only God is holy altogether. And his blood-bought redeemed are made righteous only by his power. Those who strive to bring honor to the name when they wear it. To admit that we are human is an admission of humility. It's a, it's a good place to be. It's to be humble. Because it is not to be an excuse to not pursue the divine plan. It is no excuse to not be compelled by the love and grace of God to follow the perfect plan by the perfect Lord to perfect us. In this way, you can help unpack a lot of that bad baggage that people have in the past. In this way, you can help overcome others and maybe even your own misperceptions of church and what it's all about. And in the process, you may be able to even help, through the power of God, help others and yourself heal from deep scars and see the reality that church is indeed awesome. Let the world see, let the world hear what the church is all about when they genuinely, when they observe you genuinely and intentionally carrying out the life of righteousness of your Lord. So with many perceptions of the church, a lot of uh, different people, we see the need to see things through God's eyes. And today and all of this year, we will do that very thing. We will be going to the scripture to see the church through his eyes. I want to mention and highlight four reasons the church is awesome. It has an awesome Savior. Of course, we'll start with that. Jesus is the Son of God Himself. As the Word of God, He created everything. He's above, beyond this universe. As God, He is holy. And here's a fact of reality. It's on the surface what makes the gospel seem not so good because it forces people to admit their place humbly in the world. Fact of reality, our Creator God is so holy, so just, that the consequences of sin is eternal separation from Him. Romans 6.23. That doesn't sound very good, does it? It's just a, one of those facts of life to deal with. God is holy. I am of partaking of sin and the consequence is severe. It, sin is that serious to God. I'm thankful for a few verses we'll share in just a moment. And yet, as the omniscient God who knows all, the omnibenevolent God who is all gracious and loving and giving, He could see the predicament of humankind. He's in heaven. And He is compelled by His own goodness to enact the plan that he had from before the foundation of creation to do something so marvelous that any words in any language fall short. But it is stated this way by translation in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus. Who is he? God in flesh. He came. God entered his creation with a focus, bullseye, laser beam focus on planet Earth. To do what? He left heaven to come here <laughs> to seek. The Greek word is very strong here to indicate urgency. To speedily search and scour for something that's important. And to save it. What is to save? To prevent harm or death, retrieve and protect. 
to protect all what? The lost. He came from heaven to earth to protect the lost. That's humanity. That's you and me. He rushed out of heaven to save us. Or as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his monogenes, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He has to ha give us the choice or else there is no love, but have everlasting life. He loves us enough to give us a choice to choose rightly him who loves us so much. How great is our God? How great is our Savior? He left heaven to make redemption possible. And the way he made that possible is incredible. God chose by his own goodness to pay the penalty, to compensate for that justness of God, the sin of humanity, by entering his own creation to live as a human and to die a human's death on the cross. The fact he was God on that cross atones for my sin. All this and more, according to John 10.10, 10, is so that we could have the abundant life that's found only in Him. And beyond that, we have the hope of eternal life with Him. The blessings that are now are incredible. I don't want to live one second without these blessings in Christ. But right now on this planet, we have something greater to look forward to, and it will one day be a reality. The hope of being with Him eternally where he dwells. That plan is for his family. Many people think that religion is just a long list of rules, of fun things not to do, because they prioritize sin and they don't know the holiness of God. But perspective changes when you see the holiness of God, the severity of sin, and the glory of his loving grace. Those who come to him for salvation happily live out their purpose in life as a faithful functioning member of his church. That's the way it works. Salvation, inseparable from all that we've just discussed. His church was paid for. His church was paid for. It was bought with his own blood. So it's pretty important to God. Much more than it is important to some people who don't see it that way. But that's how much he loves it. That's how important it is. Here is a very key point. Now, amazingly, people don't choose to come to the church, even though they hear this. But here's an important point. He died to offer redemption for all humanity. But his saving blood purchased his church. By emphasis, do you dis did, did, uh, discern the distinction there? Not everyone will be purchased by that blood. With his blood, he only purchased redemption for his church. Those who have come to him for salvation, as the scriptures say, upon which time they are instantly added to his church. For whoever believes in him and are baptized in his name. Ephesians 5 25 says, again, by comparison, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Here's what Christ did. Gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word, so that he might present the church to himself. Sprinkle or any such. Holy. Holy without blemish. Our awesome Savior is doing so much to make sure He presents the church to Himself and to God, the Father, as holy, to reflect His glory. Wow. If you're like me, you want that. But if you're also like me, you acknowledge that apart from Jesus Christ, we are not that. We fall short. We let him down so much, so often. And it often seems like we will never overcome all temptation. It seems like we will always be plagued forever with corruption in this human existence. Well, that's why Jesus came. 
He came to save you and set you free and to cleanse you and give you victory through Him. Thank you for that amen. Preachers love that, by the way. I'd love to hear more of it. He makes it possible. He makes it possible for His precious bride to be presented holy and righteous and undefiled. His church still represents all that is to be right and pure and holy and just in this world. Jesus is an awesome Savior of an awesome church. But let's be more brief with the remaining ones because that was so important to establish. Now we can move forward. It accomplishes an awesome work. I encourage all good deeds, scripturally done for God's glory. However, it's too easy for us to get too busy that we get distracted from the primary work that Christ Himself, the Christ gave us a primary work. Let's not get distracted from it. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, The church is the pillar and the support or the buttress of truth. So the church upholds truth. No other organization of divine origin can speak this justly and say, I uphold all truth. No organization does that. But the church, His church, and before you underestimate the power of this, I want to reference what the truth does. In a world of so many... 34 teaches... from all sin... Counsel, and I encourage people to embrace all good advice. Seek counsel constantly, often. Good books, good people. But no human being can give me the priceless blessing of knowing that my sins are forgiven through Christ. You can't put a price tag on living a life without doubts, without despairs, Without fears, without anxiety. Even to have, as Steve mentioned earlier, a proper view of yourself. No other organization does this fully, entirely, properly. The church should be doing this as the beacon of light to the world to see. We have a lot to live up to. And brethren, I've said it before in casual conversation, but all of us have so much to live up to that we need to take everything about the church more seriously than we do. Always more seriously. Letter C, Ephesians 3, indicates that the church is to bring glory to God. For those of us who have been set free, <laughs> spreading the gospel news is a work that we're just happy to do. He's done so much for us. We are eager to help Him in this, whatever that be. To help and encourage this for people to see how great the church is. Working this awesome work is just awesome. Point three, section three. It provides an awesome family. The whole theme this year is his family. In the Bible, the church is, of course, not a building. It's not a service. I mentioned the phrase earlier, have church. Some people just see it as a, a service time. But his church is his Awesome group of people called out from the world to live holy lives. I referenced Acts 8, 3 just because, though it's a dark text, it indicates that people are the church. The church is people. Christ's people. Christ's church is His people who belong to Him and make up an awesome group of people. A family of His name. Matthew nineteen twenty eight explains that there are several sacrifices a lot of people make in order to be part of that church, some that we've never had to make. Can you imagine being disowned from your biological family and maybe all the blessings that come with that to be part of something you know is better? Matthew 19, Jesus references this and says, Think of the hundredfold increase that you have received just by now being part of a spiritual family, a heaven-born, blood-bought, eternal family that will last forever. You can't meet all your spiritual siblings in this life. It's impossible. 
We'll have an eternity to fellowship with many of them, and I'm looking forward to that. But you will be a mutual blessing to everyone that you come in contact with who is a believer in Christ. There's so many times that church members, family members just need help. And sometimes strangers who don't even know you as, as brethren will help and assist. That's what family does. But in the church, we also find and are to find and are to be the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24. Within the church are to be people who, now listen very carefully to these descriptors, who can help us with daily issues spiritually. People who can be found, who can and will accept you where you are and help you get where you need to be. People who will love you too much and realize God is the judge. Too much to condemn for all your past sins, which Christ has already forgiven, and for which the current temptations you're facing can be overcome with help. In the church, you should be able to find a family that won't shun you, won't do anything but rally to help you with whatever your heart is going through. Within the church, you should allow others that blessing by being that person who they can come to for those blessings. James chapter 5 verse 16 says we can confess our sins to one another. And instead of judging, shunning, ridiculing, and belittling, we'll pray for one another. We don't often see the blessings nor experience the blessings that we're supposed to have because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. All this showing of love and understanding and, and acceptance while soliciting God's assistance leads to spiritual healing and growth. It's incredible the blessings that can only come from doing it God's way. This is an awesome thought describing an awesome family. Section 4, it leads to an awesome life. Romans seven fourteen and following describe my life outside of Christ. Even when wanting to do right, you always find yourself doing wrong. And, and our soul will always be filled with fear and anxiety and depression and shame outside of Christ. But verse 25 jumps to the praise. We praise God, our Savior, who delivered us, past tense, and keeps us protected, present tense, from that miserable way of life. Jesus, the Christ, will deliver us, any who come to Him, from the, the guilt and shame of the law of sin. And as we grow, here's the beautiful part, Galatians 5, His spiritual fruit will grow in our heart. Do you suppose that living a life enriched by God's Love and joy and peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control would bless your life. There is nothing that he could give us that would enrich our lives even more than his essence of himself in this life. And what, what we grow mature in, we only want more of. And to the utmost, we will experience it in heaven. We have something better to look forward to. The best is yet to come. Oh, with the things of righteousness I love. In contrast to this world, I look forward to heaven. And that's something to look forward to. Let her see. Being in Christ, His church, leads to eternity. Mentioned Romans 3.23 earlier, not a pleasant picture that humanity has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the penalty of separation from Him. Well, what's the good news? Romans 6.23, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ. And that view of eternity affects my view of death and it affects how I live every day. It's a paradigm shift. That makes all the difference in life. People need to know Christ. They need to know His church. And they need to see it through us. 
to want to be a part of it. In conclusion, we want to, here at Oak Hill, increasingly glorify God even more. That's what we want. We're not content with the status quo. At least I hope we're not supposed to be. Let's always increasingly glorify God more. So we will. Obviously, if it hasn't been obvious already, we will be more transparent and apparently urge the personal and collective resolve to be the person and to be the congregation that God wants us to be. I mentioned earlier that everything matters. Corporate worship matters. Doing it God's way matters. Our daily disciplines matter. Our fellowship matters. Our relationships matter. Our stewardship matters. Our financial use of funds matter. Every bit of our attitude, our character, our consideration, our conversation and conduct, all of that matters. For you and the whole body to be further blessed, we want to not just see, but to be what God commands and expects. More of that because it matters. If we get the heart right, everything else falls into place. And none of us are perfect. I've heard it said that the biggest room on planet earth is the room to grow. Glad you're here this morning. He says so much. That is a blessed decision. We have some other decisions to make and personal resolves. Many people have negative impressions of the church And I would not discount their experiences if you focus on people. But the Bible represents the church, Christ's church, as a divinely awesome institution, a body, a bride, a family that we can't afford to not be part of and to bring it honor by our conduct. I've said before that the most important subjects to ever discuss are matters that pertain to salvation. Salvation. Well, that's true. Church membership matters because salvation matters. It is a matter of salvation because it is a matter of whether or not we are in Christ living as He desires. If you see the need to be added to His church or to ask the prayers for blessing and the further assistance follow-up to those who are in need of some spiritual trial in their life, You too can be part of the kingdom of God and a stronger member of it. A golden brick within the temple in which God dwells is worshipped and is praised if you come to Christ as the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us what the gospel is in a nutshell. Everything that represents God on that cross dying for our sin was resurrected so that we can have promise and hope of new life in Him. The gospel is reenacted. Acts 2, Romans 6 tells you exactly what all of this is about. We are baptized into Christ. It's a full body water immersion to reenact symbolically the death, yes, but that's where we by faith walk to and step down into the blood where His death was shed, the cleansing blood, so that our soul can be cleansed by the Lord's power. Only He can transfer us into the kingdom. In that faith response for salvation... He adds us to his body of redeemed. Are you subject to that Lord's invitation right now? We want you to be part of that family as we stand and as we sing.